the other thing I want to do is I want to concentrate here on this other feature, the so-called mantle plume, because this has been very controversial in geology for a number of decades. Geophysicists, we'll say, geologists that have a, a strong uh, uh, background in physics, uh, have not been able to actually detect a true mantle plume underneath uh, Yellowstone. But we haven't been able to recognize this until uh, fairly recently, 2018, where we have been able to see, uh, through seismic tomography, a large conduit of uh, low-density magma, a mantle plume, if you will, that rises from the core mantle boundary all the way up to Yellowstone. So if you look at the granite, you can see basically a smooth granite knob. And if you look at limestone, you can also see that these hills have been smooth. So again, these are big landscape features that you can see and start figuring out where the ice was. But he was being somewhat uh, taunted by what was here before he arrived. Um, he was amazed as he crossed the basin that there were so many skeletal remains of the bison herds. So not only is the reservation uh, working and being, you know, being supported by the two tribal councils in Buffalo Restoration, but this has implications for even off-reservation. Our proximity to Yellowstone means we can be, become leaders in tribal bison conservation as well as conservation of, of those important Yellowstone genetics. Spotted bats are really important because they are one of those species of greatest conservation need. This is really high for this species, 3,200 meters. Um, and it's a really interesting find if we validate this and we find out that this is true. And the last component of that is spotted bats are one of the species that does consume moths. So moth sites tend to be at really high elevation. So we have spotted bats at high elevation. There, this link might actually exist, and if it does, that'd be really fascinating. It's not all about moths up there. Um, the, in the big picture, uh, we know some of the food sources uh, we identified are commonly eaten by bears throughout the Yellowstone ecosystem, and other studies have shown that the GYE is a really diverse ecosystem. There's a lot of locally important foods out there, and bears are good, really good at finding and using those food sources. And that seems to be w exactly what's happening at the moss sites as well. I don't see a real concern that bears will, will, will have issues responding to climate change in terms of, of heat stress. What might be a factor is um, regeneration potential of, of, of forest. I don't want you to walk out of here thinking that, well, Pikas can just adjust, maybe other high elevation alpine species can just adjust as temperatures change, so we're gonna be fine. That is a part of the story here, but a lot of these strategies and the strategies that we see all across the world as species deal with environmental variability rely on having sufficient resources to be able to use these strategies. So while the factors impacting moose vary and it's really tricky to untangle exactly what's going on across the range, there are some things that stay pretty consistent, and that is that moose are a cold adapted species. The other side of the coin to this, to being a cold adapted species, is that it also means they're really heat sensitive. And, um, one of the reasons that they're so heat sensitive, beyond just the fact that they have these really large bodies and dark hair, is that they don't have the physiological ability to sweat.